Dust or magic comes from this quote from Matsubashi that an idea can turn from dust to magic depending upon the talent that rubs against it. And as a reviewer for over 20 years, I've seen very small publishers who understand the power of interactive media who've made amazing products. So it isn't necessarily about the size of the marketing budget, it's about understanding the interaction. Our challenge now is how do we harness the power for kids? This is how you win the 2017 Bologna Wagazi Digital Award. Don't stray too far from a good story and good illustrations. Old theories always drive the best interactive design. Specifically, the, the big ones are constructivism and behaviorism. And once you understand those two theories of development and growth, a lot of apps and why they work snap into place. Candy Crush is behaviorism applied with rewards and intermittent reinforcement. That's where the magic is. Don't get seduced by AR, although David's going to fill us in on what we really need to know about AR and VR. Remember RR. RR is real reality. That's RR. That's RR. Because that child is going to hear the birds and feel the wind on their face. And there's no technology that can replace that. In the in terms of the contest, originality and innovation count for a lot. So the jurors were looking for things that nobody had done before. This is a brand new medium. It's only five years old. The tablet format, multi-touch. It's brand new. Demand is growing. That, so there's good news and bad news. And uh, Neil is going to cover a lot of this in the panel. Demand is growing. There's a bigger install base and more smart kids who are starved for good media. The bad news is the market is flooded with cheap content and no one really can, has figured out the monetization puzzle. We're seeing a lot of sloppy work. And sloppy work, whether it's on paper or whether it's on a screen, is still sloppy work. And it might be a font that runs over into an illustration or just carelessly thinking about all of the attention to detail that uh, traditional publishers think about before they hit press and run 10,000 printed copies. And a, a big one that is often understated is stay ethical when dealing with children. Children are a very special audience. And there, is a, there are a lot of business people who are pushing designers into unethical territory. And, and so it's very important not to be evil. We borrowed that from Google. Um, and nobody wants five stars more than a child, and we all want five stars, so let's work together and figure it out. And to do that, let's turn to a master. So, I have one. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Warren, for inviting me to Italy. This is my first time in Bologna, my first time in Italy. Um, looking forward to meeting a lot of you. Um, so, I lead a team uh, based in Toronto, who we make Psycho Um we look at ourselves as a digital toy company, and we were established three years ago. Uh, though most of the team has actually been working in the field for 10, 15 years. So who is Psycho Mini? Um, very briefly, uh, you know, we define ourselves as using digital technology to create opportunities for pretend play and for uh, open play. So what that means is that our apps are designed essentially uh, as devices for kids to interact with, but without an agenda, without assessment, uh, uh, and with a sense that the kids can kind of bring their own narrative to the experience. So we recently published our 17th app. Uh, they're all designed for sort of two to four year olds as our core uh, audience. And I've been very successful with them. Um, so today I'm basically going to talk through basically a little bit of our process and in particular sort of our, our design philosophy and how we do this. What Warren doesn't know is I only actually have one talk. I just kind of iterate on it each time and add stuff. <laughs> and I'm hoping at the end uh, I can show you the app we're working on right now and relate them back a little bit to the design principles. Uh, and also I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to uh, do some questions and answers, and if we run out of time, we can do that uh, later on. So the key to all of this is playtesting. 
It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, how many years of experience you have in working with children, building things. If you don't put your product in front of kids, often and early and frequently, you won't know if you've done it properly. Um, so we work really hard to sort of build up a mailing list of families in Toronto. And about once a month, uh, often, sometimes more, we invite them to come by the studio and play with the stuff that we're working on. Um, we have them play prototypes of our projects, we have them play things we've already published, we have them play apps from other companies, and we often have them play with physical toys where we think there's maybe a learning that we can uh, bring into our digital products. So, how does this work? A lot of people talk about playtesting. It's not complicated, but it's also very easy to screw it up. Um, the key point is probably number two, play dumb. We're not here to validate our assumptions. We're not here to impress these kids with how amazing our work is. We're here to look through their eyes and see what they see. So this is what a typical play testing is. This is actually just last week. Uh, on the right is Dad Risk, who's one of our play designers. And you can see he's looking really bored. And there's kind of a reason for that. He's just trying to do wallpaper. Um, Mom is there, and uh, you'll also notice we have a little camera, which is a webcam, that's mounted onto the, little, onto the iPad. Um, this is mostly useful for winning arguments with the developers. <laughs> because they won't believe it until they see it with their own two eyes. We can sit there and say, look, this didn't work, they're frustrated, there was an you know, awkward moment here, and, and come back will come like, oh, I'm sure that's just that kid, or there's this going on, or that going on, and uh, video evidence really works. Um, so you can show that video, you can see that kid repeatedly going for something, uh, it really stands out. Um, but it's useful for all of us, so we can go back and see what's happening. Um, we, uh, you know, the key with play down and quiet observation is to say as little as possible. We often, um, you know, suggest that we just want to see what they're doing. We sometimes disassociate ourselves you know, from the product and say, oh, there's this game I found, you want to try it. And then we try to say as little as possible. If they get stuck, we don't, we don't intervene unless they're at a complete roadblock. So if they're going to struggle, we need to see them kind of struggle their way through things. Um, we involve the product team, so Davin is intimately involved in this particular project, and uh, there was he alternated with another person on the team, so both of them could do separate playtesting sessions and then compare notes at the end. Um, this is key because like, I used to work at a public broadcaster where they had a special person who did all the playtesting, would write a report, and then that would go to the product team, and then they would ignore it. Um, so what we need is we need those people in the room. Um, there's nothing like a frustrated, upset child to motivate developers and designers to improve things. So when we first started the Sego Mini project, we sat down and we asked ourselves these two questions. And as a result of this, uh, we developed a set of Sego Mini lenses. So they're basically questions that we ask ourselves throughout the design development process to see if we're on track. And there's sort of two types of questions. One is just what makes a great app for this audience? You could apply those to most children's apps. But then the other one is sort of what makes this Sega Mini-ish? Because there are some things that are going to be different depending on the type of apps you're producing. The key here is, again, there's no magic formula, there's no recipe to doing this. So I'm going to talk through uh, six of these. And the list is actually much longer. There's just 20 or so on uh, lenses, and we keep changing them as we go. But these are six kind of important ones. Uh, the first is, uh, when it comes to interface, we always ask ourselves, can we do it with direct manipulation? So can we do it without relying on the UI conventions that are, we, are, as adults, are so accustomed to? Close buttons and menus and tabbed panes and all of these things are largely meaningless to a three-year-old. If they see something, they want to, they, when they want to manipulate it, they are just going to go for it. 
And so uh, if there's anything that's hints of traditional UI, we always ask ourselves, what other way can we do this? So here's a bit of an example. Um, this is uh, Forest Flyer, which was our very first app, and we just launched a refresh of it this week. And when you first start the app, it just rests on this screen. And a lot of adults will sit there and stare. Sometimes they will look at you, ask what I'm supposed to do. But no three-year-old does that. Um, they just tap on the house. Okay, so that's your opening little moment. It's just that, um, that first little step into the experience of the app, and it's just, here's a, here's a house, here's a door, what are you gonna do? You're gonna knock on the door, invite your friend out. Control, this is probably the, big, the biggest of them all. Um, is control unnecessarily limited or taken away during play? Consciously or unconsciously, we're always making decisions about what the kids can and cannot do, what they can interact with, what they can't interact with in the app. And, you know, we you know, often inadvertently destroy a lot of the uh, great part of working with physical toys where kids will misuse them in interesting and creative ways. And so uh, we want to sort of, sometimes we have to look critically and take away restraints. So here's a specific example. Uh, this is an app uh, called Road Trip. Let's play the video again. So this app, you just drive a little car, in this case a bathtub car. So did you catch that? There was, there was a gasp there. <laughs> And in the, in the very beginning with this app, um, we actually had planned to have the, the car on a rail, and you were basically just driving in a linear path all along. And it was in one of the early prototypes that that was kind of broken. And then we saw this, where the kids were like, wait, this is way cooler. I can just fly my car to the destination. And they can fling it around and throw it around. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, you know, you know, in the, in the eyes of the developer and designer, it's not necessarily part of the plan. You put it in front of kids, and you know, it seems obvious. You give kid, a kid a toy car, they drive it along the floor, sure, but they also just do this, right? Um, so we took away that restraint and gave more control over to the kid. Open. So this is essentially going back to that thing about narrative. Um, so we try in our apps not, this is like, the, the anti-children's book, perhaps, in that we think of ourselves as toy, we try to let the kids make up the stories. Um, so we want there to be opportunities for them to invent stories and for them to invent goals. Just to demonstrate this, this is the map of, from an app called uh, Space Explorer. And in Space Explorer, you have this little character, you fly all through space, and you make friends, and you trigger little animations. The key is that uh, although these animations are sort of scripted, the kid can do them in any order. They can move from this to that, to that, to that, to that, to that. And uh, inevitably, they will start talking. And again, that's one of those great things in playtesting. When you hear the kid talking, and you're starting to like, OK, I'm going to go visit my friend, and OK, I'm, and they're talking to the characters and making up things, um, then we know we've done something right. Responsiveness. This is both um, a design thing as well as a technical thing. So for design, it's are we acknowledging every time the ch child touches the screen? And the other is technically, technically, are we able to make it respond in a really fast, performant way? If if your button takes two seconds to respond, then they will not, they will be unable to make that connection of what they have done and the end result. It has to be really immediate. So here's an example. This is an app called Music Box, where you can tap anywhere on the screen, and it plays a note, and it generates art and animation.
So when you play with this, a lot of effort was drawn, went into making sure that everything that happened was immediate and really quick, and there's no wrong places to touch. Like the entire screen is a playground. But the other thing to keep in mind is this is how, this is how I play Music Box. This is how kids play Music Box. <laughs> This kid was playing by himself, and he recruited his brother to come and help him because he needed more, 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 more. And so, uh, again, we call this the MASH test when we're doing our QA processes. No, no, no child is going to carefully pick the buttons one at a time. They are going to just go crazy. And if you're capturing, you know, up to the ten touch events, you can. It is so I can crash so many children's apps just by doing this or cause it to lock up and freeze. So this is essential to do this. Surprise. This is also, we have another one which is giggles, but this is kind of related. And essentially, how can we throw in little extra moments um, which, which, you know, uh, get a giggle, bring a little surprise, but aren't completely disorienting? And don't throw them off course or just confuse them completely. And these things are often not obvious uh, because we, we often kind of bury them. So this is uh, an example from the Trucks and Diggers app. I'm filling the truck with dirt. That's actually designed to come up like one out of 40 times and then even then only one of three times we play the game. If it happened every time, it would lose all of its impact. These are things that are always hard to defend in our schedule, right? They're always the things like, why are we putting so much work into this thing which only one kid, you know, kids only going to see every hour of playtime. Um, but the reaction you get out of there makes it all, all worthwhile. Um, so the next one is uh, gender stereotypes. Um, so this is something that we always ask ourselves about, is how are we representing the genders? And how do we kind of keep that as, as sort of open and fluid and uh, as, as possible? Our characters don't overtly have genders, but they are kind of, they're there. So as a good example, in the fairy tales app, you fly around and explore with Ginger the cat, and there's a little treasure box, and you dive into the treasure box, and you come out with a costume on. And here's Ginger as a knight and Ginger as a princess. And sometimes you go in and come out as a knight. Sometimes you go in and you come out as a princess. And that, the idea is to sort of leave that there. This is good. I'm making good time. So here's the, full, the six, again, of those lenses. I'm happy to share this in whatever form is sensible um, with, with the group. And like I said, I think you can easily take this approach to any project you're working on. It's worth stepping back, sitting down. If you're adapting something from a book property, for example, just distill down, like, what are the sort of key characteristics? Write it down. It seems silly, but write it down before you even start, and then halfway through, three quarters of the way through, all the way through, and even after you're done, go back and ask yourself these questions. Um, we do a, an app critique workshop in-house where we get uh, other people's apps and we run them through our lenses. And we spend half a day just going through and scoring other people's apps, um, especially the new staff. It's really important for them to kind of soak this up. Okay, so. I went a little bit quickly because I wanted to show you the app we're working on right now. It's called Robot Party. And I'm going to try to switch to the camera here and see if that works. So who's going to help me? Can you help me? Should we go for the green one?
Bananas, sure, why not? Okay, so, so far so good. We've uh, got some fun parts on here. Bowling ball is a popular choice. Um, if you got fit. No, I don't like that one. There we go. Okay. But, you know, what does a kid do when they uh, come to the play test? They want to do that. Sure, that seems reasonable. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it was part of the conversation. Like, developers like, well, why don't we stop them from putting the heads on? It's so easy. Why don't we do that? And you notice also that the robot's reacting, so there's a range of little emotional responses there. You drop a head. Oh, they're not so thrilled about that. Let's go with that. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should mention that one of the first things we did in this project is we um, we just said, okay, parents on the staff and friends and friends, like, go ask your kids, what do robots do? And we were kind of expecting, I don't know, all the normal robot-y things, and what we got basically is the kid was wanted a playmate, they wanted someone to do the things that they thought would be fun, and that's where this whole robot party thing um, kind of took off. So we've built this system essentially that you know you touch and you're basically providing instructions uh, to the robot. <coughs> Another thing about we talked about the control thing is what what do you think is the very first thing that a kid did at this point? They the robot. And at the beginning, I mean, you couldn't even you couldn't pick these things up. They were kind of locked down. So that didn't last long. Um, you can if you want. Some kids were like, no, I want to actually control the hand and trigger things directly. They didn't want just to do that. So fine, we do both. Um, we got a garlic clove here. That's fun. So every like 20th thing, there's just a, an apple core. We've got some watermelon in there somewhere. And again, I'm not playing like a three-year-old. This might be how a three-year-old chooses to play. Uh. You notice how he's watching? Like his eyes look where you're touching? It's again part of that, like this thing of the line. So we're gonna play a little music in the robot. Like that, bring in something different. And again, you can just another little touch. Um, when we first did this, it would just pick the nearest limb, and that's what would hit the thing. So with buttons over there, foot would hit there, buttons over there, foot would hit there. It's way funnier if we just throw the head in once in a while. So uh, there's sort of a random element to it where sometimes go with the closest, and sometimes it just picks the random one. Hot dog pinata with pickles. chaotic experience. Okay, time to look good. 
Congratulations, you've now made your robot. Now it's time to go back and do it again. So, um, going back to uh, what I talked about before, you'll see like we really have uh, uh, a minimum of traditional interface elements. Um, we try to accommodate uh, open play and, and hand over control you know, as much as possible and sort of watch the way the kids are playing and then build it to work that way. Um, you know, we don't go by the notion of like, well, how do we stop the kid from doing these things? Um, the responsiveness, you see like you can take all five fingers and grab different parts of the robots and, and go crazy. Um, lots of little surprises like the garlic clove um, like some of the random body parts, things like that. Um, and then the gender question really came down to like ensuring that we had something that felt bright and colorful and and fun and didn't fall into that trap of you know just a blue gray aesthetic, a lot of mechanical things going on um, that we feel works uh, for boys and girls. Okay. Um, so. I am done. I have three minutes and 52 seconds for questions. When is the app come out, Jason? Uh, it's going to come out uh, the end of April, or possibly early May. We'll see how QA goes. So now we, we've essentially finished the main part of the app. I was sending some ideas on my plane ride over here, and the last set of release notes from the developer had uh, um, if you have any comments or suggestions, la 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 la, I can't hear you. So we're now at the point where like, let's cut it off, and it goes to QA, so we have someone who sits down and relentlessly plays this on a dozen different devices before we submit. Yeah? So um, we're fortunate in that we generally don't have a strict deadline, but that's actually the worst thing to, to be, the worst position to be in. Um, so we have self-imposed deadlines, and we're fairly good about sticking to it. We really try to, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a dangerous thing, because of course you don't want to ship it until it's perfect, and until it's ready, but at the same time, if you're not careful about that, you will put, you will defer dis difficult decisions, and it will go on and on. There's sort of a pre-production phase where we're working on the concept, uh, and then there's a key part where, and that's normally just two or three people um, who are doing prototyping and wireframing and prototyping. Then there's, and that is flexible. That can sometimes take a month, sometimes it takes three months. And then when we, we're like, yes, we have a good idea what this is going to be, then we sit down, we scope it out using an agile process, we break down all the features and how long it's gonna take, and we get a bigger team to join in at that point. Uh, and we have a sense, we have a timeline at that point. Average, how long does it take to make one month? Give or take six months. Yeah. And uh, things tell us uh, which is the best period uh, when it's published and afterwards. Okay, you told me that we don't have a student anymore. Yeah. Usually? I mean, uh, yeah, so we, uh, the only thing I can say to that is like, you know, November and December are always popular times for people buying apps. Um, yeah, uh, we have most of our you know, busy times are during holidays. Um, but that's a difficult decision to choose strategically what is the best time. There's many factors going on. I'm curious how you assemble the existing group. Do you have a team or We do, um, but it's not actually an upfront offer. So um, essentially, we go to a lot of events. Uh, we go to kids' cafes. We go to the biggest uh, Word on the Street, which is a big children's book fair in Toronto. Um, we partner with different kids' uh, uh, centers in Toronto. So we have a, a basically a mailing list. And it's a lot of work actually to keep that keep those relationships going because they also they, they, they keep aging. If we can stop them from aging, that would be great. So your group is constantly changing. Yeah. yeah. 
in the back there. We've just a question. Do you get questions about the onboarding and like what are we supposed to do? What is the aim of the game? Like all, like yeah, from big people. So we do have that. From big people, from uh, platforms? Uh, yeah, sometimes from platforms, yeah. That's true. Sometimes from Apple and Google and places yeah. like that, yeah. they'll sit down and say, well, where are the instructions? Yeah, where, where's, All of that. Well, what's your response? Um, I'm, uh, I mean, I've actually given a form of this presentation to some people I know at the platforms. <laughs> and, I, and we've talked through, just to show them, like, look, we've tested those. A lot of people were confident that this is the way it works. Um, we can point them to other art past successes. It depends on the app, obviously, but... Um, there is definitely, you'll get it from the parents too, which are, which sometimes will leave reviews where like, I don't understand yeah. why, what's, what is the point of this, and what's the purpose of this, and what am I supposed to do? But my kid really likes it five stars. So it's very, it's, it's a difficult thing. Mm. Okay, so how about you? Me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, Sago Sago and Chocolate Boca is kind of related? Yes. Do you, yeah. you, and you both use Unity? We both use Unity, yeah. Can you like share the same code? I mean, I saw that some of you talk about the some of your robot stuff is a little bit like the, the dressing thing from... Yeah. Do um, you share code? We don't share code, really, um, except for some of the back-end things like analytics and some of the infrastructure things. Right. Um, so they have a studio in Stockholm which develops all the Toko Boca apps, and from time to time we, we share expertise. So our developers will sit down and just sort of, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what they're doing, but we don't have a common code base or anything like that. But it's a help. Or oh yeah, sure. It's it's, it's great. You make your presentation on the phone. Do children pay more on phones or tablets? I don't know. You don't know? But well, the majority of our sales come from tablets. Okay. Thank you. Most of our revenue comes from iPad sales. Okay. Um, have you ever had an idea and almost finished it and then you have to trash it? Yes. <laughs> Why? It's sad. <laughs> um, mostly because it. It can, it can fail for a number of different reasons. Like the number one is just that the kids do not perceive it in the way that we had envisioned or hoped in our minds. And that's really hard, where we've, we've kind of grown to love an idea, we've taken it, done a lot of work sometimes. Uh, and uh, it, it had, it, I know um, Toga Dance is actually one example where they had to, they, that was like three different apps that got trashed <laughs> and then eventually turned into Toga Dance. Have to. He's going to cut me off. Last one. one more. Right. Well, I'm not going anywhere. So. He'll, he'll be a good yeah. Can you give us an example of something that had to be trashed or something that didn't work? So, one example Dust. Yeah. We had this app that was called, loosely called Maker. And it was a, an app that was kind of like these gooey balls that you could stick to each other and you could make it into anything you want. And uh, it was very like construction app, kind of like Lego, but with these balls of goo. And it, I really loved it for a lot of reasons, but when we put it in front of kids, they really struggled because it was, um, it was too unstructured. Um, it was just a little bit too much blank slate, and it didn't really work because there wasn't, we had trouble kind of getting a narrative that would get the kids involved. There's this fine balance between wanting to have it very open-ended and let the kid make anything they wanted with this building thing, and being too open. So it's like, okay, so we try applying different themes to it. So you were building a toy to give to a friend, or like you were building a building for your friends to live inside of, and, and just nothing really worked. It could have been a good app, but it wouldn't have been a great sale of an app. You ditched it. 